Hello everyone, warmly welcome to Moderna Museet. My name is Camilla Karlberg and I'm head of public programs department here at the museum. Tonight we have uh, three distinguished guests and an anthology, a new anthology to present. The anthology is called The Exhibitionist and uh, The Exhibitionist is a magazine that was founded by Mr. Jens Hoffman. Jens Hoffman is here tonight and he is a writer and an exhibition maker. Uh, he is also at the Jewish Museum, uh, currently working as the director of special exhibitions and public programs and he is also the curator at large at the Museum for Contemporary Art in Detroit. Uh, Jens Hoffman founded this magazine in 2010 and now 12 issues have come out and they have now been compiled into this anthology, The Exhibitionist, which will be presented in a few minutes. Uh, we have also Olle Granat here, former director of Moderna Museet and former director of National Museum and also former permanent secretary of the um, Academy of Fine Arts in Stockholm. But further presentations will come. Uh, after um, Jens presentation, uh, Daniel will also say a few words and he will also be moderating the discussion. And we will end this uh, evening around, well, shortly before eight. I would also like to say to you that the anthology can be bought in the bookshop and the price is 580 crowns, I think. So. Daniel, please. Thanks. Yes, welcome everyone. I'm so happy this can happen. It started with a, a conversation with Jens some months ago when I heard that the book will come out. And uh, um, for us here at the museum, this evening is quite closely linked to some of our ambitions in the museum, primarily relating to uh, Pontus Hultén's study library, the little space next to us. Uh, it's a mixture of a library and a storage space and an exhibition space. Um, it has climate, so one can show a Matisse painting in there, but one can also show sketches and have conversations. It's a more discursive and intellectual space. That's how we want to see it. We've done many small things, um, sometimes visually humble, but intellectually quite ambitious, uh, relating to exhibition and exhibition stories. Um, we did something um, or a number of things uh, uh, that had to do with the history of situationism. Uh, as I'm sure you all know, one of the founding members was Scandinavian, Asker Jon. So we showed his archive here and we had Jacqueline de Jong, who was a f also an early member of the situationist group. She was here with Michelle Bernstein. And um, what we also do uh, is that we look into exhibitions that have happened here at the museum. I mean, most of us think about art history as something uh, primarily maybe to do with the artists. The big names uh, tend to structure how we look an, on art. Sometimes individual artworks that become so visible that they kind of dominate everything. But of course, one can also remind everyone of the fact that most art, most art enters the public domain through an exhibition. And uh, it's a different unit, it's a different uh, uh, way to look upon art history, to think about the art exhibition as the basic unit. Not every art piece has been part of a legendary show or so, but many have. And it's a, it's a different way to look upon things. Um, sometimes all that remains, some decades later, is a book. Here's uh, Flyktpunkter, Vanishing Points, a very important show curated by Ulle here. And uh, what do we actually know about this show? Well, we have, we have some names. Mel Bochner, Tom Doyle, Dan Graham, Eva Hesse, Solowit, Robert Smithson, Ruth Vollmer. We have archival material here. But normally, you know, it's a history of oblivion, the whole, the whole idea of, of exhibitions. And that's why I find it so interesting that Jens is such an ambitious archivist and... and, and uh, <coughs> and the genealogist, basically, looking into the history of recent art with the exhibition as the, as the fundamental unit. And we share this interest through our little space here. So I think the space is almost meant to present Jens' book. And Jens' book is, uh, you know, needs our space to fully make sense. Uh, we have uh, um, four vitrines right now where we show some archival material. This 
may look very, very, uh, what should I say, dry and, and, uh, and um, academic, but it's interesting letters and uh, faxes and exchange to do with four exhibitions. We've done something about Paul Tech there some years ago, but right now it's simply four vitrines and we will add to those. And it's about uh, some of the best known exhibitions here at the museum. Motion in Art, Rörelse Constant. That's how Duchamp came into this Stockholm context, actually, or at least that's why we have this big, you know, the, the, the famous catalog has the bicycle wheel on, on. There it is. It's so valuable that we cannot even touch it. Uh, this is, uh, you know, catalogs is often what remains, and and stories and archives, and um, and we uh, we have she a cathedral, maybe the most well known uh, 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 exhibition that ever happened here, vanishing points that Ulle did, implosion. Uh, uh, some of these shows have introduced entirely new generations of artists, and I think we should. I mean. These are early shows. Since then, there's been so many interesting things, and one should not only think that everything interesting happened in, 19, in the late 1960s. I mean, think of shows like After the Wall, or Ararat, or, uh, or Maria's uh, What If, or Carsten Höller co-curated a show called Life Itself, quite a speculative kind of thing that we had here very recently. So we can move on into more recent times. It's, you know, it, 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 it it's relatively modest what we do in the space, but it takes um, events like this to bring these things to life. So Jens, I'm so happy you've come all the way to Stockholm to present your book. Um, please join me here, or rather take over from here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel, and thanks to Moderna Musette for um, allowing me to be here today to present the exhibitionist. Um, um, as um, Daniel Camilla already said, the uh, exhibitionist, what you see there right now, is a uh, volume bringing together 12 issues of the exhibitionist. It's sort of like a final point of. Uh, this particular magazine, we will no longer um, continue to publish it uh, as we did twice a year. What we will do is sort of uh, try to occupy other spaces. We are developing a new website that will be up uh, starting next month, uh, as well as sort of finding um, other niches to, to appear. We did a collaboration with the Palais de Tokyo where they inserted um, a seven and a half issue in one of their magazines uh, that they publish. And our plan is to continue to operate like uh, this in the future, potentially also publishing books and trying to find another way of um, presenting our thoughts. Um, the exhibitionist really sort of came out of uh, a number of different ideas and moments. And one in particular that I would like to mention was uh, a conference that took place um, in, in 2010 at the Witte de Witt Center, which is an art center in Rotterdam, that organized a trilogy of uh, conferences. And each conference was dedicated to another practitioner in the art field, artists, uh, writers and critics and curators. And I participated in the one um, around um, curating. And um, as often in these um, coming together, it wasn't necessarily the panel discussions that were the most interesting part. It was sort of like, uh, since Ulrich Obris would say, the coffee breaks or uh, the dinners and, and lunches where we actually had um, most of our ideas. And um, we all sort of lamented um, the non-existence of a platform where we could continuously discuss issues of uh, uh, exhibition making or uh, curating. Um, another thing that sort of I sense while we were having our conversation was that many curators became sort of tired of making exhibitions. Um, they felt like that exhibitions were too connected to institutions and um, through that maybe perhaps connected to ideologies that were no longer relevant or outdated. And um, I myself um, sort of argued vehemently for the importance of the exhibition as an experience and um, still believe that most of, of what we do within an exhibition is really sort of like still touching only the surface of what the potential of exhibitions ultimately um, can really be. 
Um, another inspiration for the exhibitionist was also the French uh, journal Cahier de Cinéma, and we actually kind of copied the entire graphic design of the exhibitionist um, on Cahier de Cinéma, which was a famous, which has still exists, a, f a famous French film magazine that um, started in 1951. Um, so we paid sort of homage to Cahiers de Cinéma also because the entire magazine, The Exhibitionist, was written by, by curators. We didn't invite artists, we didn't invite critics, we wanted uh, curators to express um, and articulate uh, their thoughts. But there was a particular reason why I went to um, Cahiers de Cinéma. In the issue number 31 in 1954, um, the, the filmmaker Francois Truffaut wrote a very interesting essay in, in this um, magazine, which was called A Certain Tendency in French Cinema. Um, and um, this would actually then become really important for my ideas um, on not only the magazine, but curating in general, um, where uh, Truffaut was sort of described the, f the figure of the director of, of the Nouvelle Vague as uh, somewhat of an author, someone who really sort of like controls the entire creative uh, spectrum and making of a film. And that was something that I could relate to very well as, as a curator to think about the theory of, of a author uh, reading, leading the formation of, of uh, creating uh, an exhibition. It, of course, these ideas have been heavily criticized. There's an interesting essay uh, by Daniel Buren in the uh, catalog of the 1972 documenta uh, that was organized by Harald Zeman, where Daniel Buren already in the early 70s, in reaction to Zeman, but also other curators uh, like Pontus Sultan, was saying that uh, uh, what we're seeing is not the exhibition itself, but we're seeing the exhibition of the exhibition as a work of art, where the exhibition itself, the, the way it is um, organized by the curator becomes a sort of like meta um, work of art. Um, let me see. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about how the uh, magazine was structured and um, hopefully you can find um, um, the table of content here. Uh, one of the things that I'm particularly proud of, and I don't know if you can see this here so very well, is um, the hundreds of authors that we have there. And if you go through the list of authors, we really managed to sort of like have all or many, many of, of um, the uh, leading voices in the curatorial debate of the last 20 years um, participating in this journal. And of course, both Maria and Daniel participated and contributed um, to the magazine. Um, this is the inside cover where we made a little bit of a joke with the 100 years of exhibition, exhibitionism, uh, which is sort of the goal of, of myself for, for this journal. So um, we have uh, um, 19 more years to go, or 88 years. Um, most of the um, issues were structured in the way that we invited um, curators in the beginning, and this is sort of like leading to what Daniel was saying about the history of exhibitions, um, a section that was called Curator's Favorites. And um, we invited three curators every issue to write about an exhibition that they had a particular relationship with or that they felt uh, was particularly important but perhaps overlooked or not uh, uh, studied enough. And that sort of like continued to... Um, in in another section which was called Back in the Day. And Back in the Day was specifically about looking at um, exhibitions that um, were completely sort of forgotten, but in some way had uh, triggered a change, a shift, not only in exhibition making, but in the way that we think about art and institutions. And I remember um, the very first one um, by Julian Myers being uh, about um, On Other Ideas, which was sort of a seminal conceptual art exhibition that took place at the Detroit Institute of um, Arts and um, for some reason, um, unfortunately, didn't really uh, get enough um, publicity, while uh, its European equivalent, When Attitudes Become Form, became um, probably one of the most talked about um, exhibitions in the history of um, exhibition making. So these are just some pages here to, to show you the, the inside of the magazine. And we always had sort of like a particular uh, um, focus on our on our cover here, Etan Donné by Marcel Duchamp, uh, was our beginning. You sort of like look through the hole and um, 
you would sort of like enter the exhibition space, just sort of like some spreads. And then one of the important elements of the magazine was that um, um, every th third issue we would publish uh, an issue that was called La Critique, which was also something that we adopted from Cahiers de Cinema. Um, they would publish um, these La Critique issues where they would debate, invite other writers to debate some of the essays and texts and contributions that were made in the previous um, um, Issues. So every third issue was uh, a critique issue um, that was sort of looking back at what we had developed in in the issues before and sort of uh, debate um, uh, that. One of the things that I think is very important to say about this um, magazine is that it's sort of like part of perhaps a, a moment of reflection uh, within curatorial practice, a moment of reflection in curatorial practice that began probably in the 1990s and has continued uh, since then, um, perhaps in the l over the last years with, with less intensity. Um, there was a whole um, moment um, of, of a lot of publications that all of a sudden sprang up um, around curating. Um, and I have the feeling that now we sort of like have reached a sort of point of saturation there. And there's not necessarily that much published it's sort of on, on curating or at least sort of like on the basics, basics of that. Um, but essentially also when you look at the magazine um, and the contributors, um, you will see that this is very much part of a particular moment and part of a particular generation. I would say that most of the curators that sort of have made major contributions to this journal or the people that are invited to be on the curatorial or editorial board uh, were um, curators that emerged in the 90s or early 2000s, um, which I would still sort of like describe uh, very much as like the period where um, as a sort of heyday of... of what we've gotten to know as the independent curator, which, in uh, my opinion, you know, since then sort of um, disappeared. This is another um, section which we called assessments, and uh, we invited usually four uh, writers, four curators, to uh, write a text about one particular exhibition. Um, so having four points of view that were very distinct to sort of reflect on on an exhibition. And this is um, the exhibition that. Philippe Pereno uh, made at the Palais de Tokyo, I think about four years ago. Um, and then later on, we begin uh, with a section that was called Six by Six, um, where we invited six um, curators to pick um, their six favorite shows um, of the last six uh, months, which was also something that we picked up from uh, Carrier de Cinema. We didn't really have any creativity ourselves in thinking about how we structure the magazine, so we really took everything from uh, Carrier de Cinema, um, even uh, smaller elements like this. Um, but um, I think I really felt like that, that um, I wanted to bring this, this, at least this printed issues, the way we did it for 12 issues to an end, um, because um, there was a sort of shift within how we think about museums, how we think about uh, exhibitions. And a lot of that has to do with also myself questioning where, where we are going with our profession as curators, given um, the dominance of, of the art market, which perhaps um, is not necessarily so much the reality in Sweden, but if you work and, and live in New York, um, it's pretty much um, what you're exposed to, to uh, um, you know, on, on a daily basis. And um, of course, you've also noticed the proliferation of art fairs and um, the sort of complexities of working in, 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 in institutions, um, which maybe also led to a rethinking of, of what, is it, what is possible within museums, what is possible within institutions. Um, and one phenomenon, and again, I'm really speaking from, from you know, my point of view that is very much influenced on what I see in the United States, uh, is, is how um, institutions are sort of kept alive just to sort of keep them alive. It doesn't really necessarily matter what is in the gallery itself, meaning there isn't... Uh, a vision that leads the institution in terms of like uh, particular ideas in terms of art or uh, exhibition making or uh, history, but um, the galleries are filled in order to keep a machine going and the curators are more and more reduced to sort of idea ma ideas 
machines for ideas, um, writing exhibition outlines and proposals um, again and again, only to see those ideas and being mutated into something completely different because of how institutions um, kind of begin to control curatorial practice through whether it's fundraising or publications departments. And I, um, we had this debate not so long ago at the Jewish Museum with many curators uh, from um, New York, and we were talking about um, uh, the interference of other departments on onto curating, and it went to like marketing departments in major museums dictating the exhibition titles to publication departments determining what is on the cover or who's going to write for the catalog and sort of a lot of like the elements that I would certainly think are completely within the sphere of the curator were sort of like taken apart and deconstructed and um, the role of the curator uh, simply really became what I said before um, as a person that um, is sort of generating um, the ideas. So this is um, just perhaps an introduction and a summary of, of um, the um, the exhibitionist. And one of the things that maybe I should say at the end now, because it relates to Stockholm, I spent time in Stockholm on several occasions. And um, one occasion was in 2001 when I was uh, adjunct professor for three months at Konstfak. Uh, that started the curatorial program there, which I think now is called Curatorial Lab. And Mons Frange was uh, at that point the chair of the department, and he asked me if I could make a course that somehow would um, teach the students a recent history of exhibitions, but at the same time also um, make an exhibition uh, themselves with the students. And I was um, having a residency at the Yaspis, um, which at that point still had curatorial residencies. And Daniel uh, generously invited me back then, it's like 16 years ago now. And um, it was an exhibition that was called Exhibition Squared. We looked at 12 important exhibitions of the 1990s and um, curated one big show out of elements um, of those shows. And there were a couple of artworks that we could uh, track down, but a lot of it was also documentation material, interviews that the students did with the curators, um, press clippings, merchandise, sort of like a kind of show about uh, 12 other shows that sort of turned into an exhibition wunderkammer with lots of different things that all had to do with um, that um, these 12 exhibitions. And it was sort of like really the beginning um, of my interest in, in the history of exhibitions and um, has sort of like become kind of like a bit of an obsession since then, sort of trying to, uh, you know, form, I kind of hesitate to use the word canon, but a sort of um, history of, of, of ex important exhibitions and, and also those that are, that are overlooked that, you know, paid attention to in, in, in the exhibitionist. Um, so I know now you're very um, eager to get the book, and I saw it. It's up there in the bookshop. So um, it's very heavy, but it's very it's very good, of course. Uh, and um, you can also use it as a doorstopper if once you've finished reading it. Okay. So I guess I'm gonna hand over now to, to Ola, Ola, and me. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. We'll come back to most of the things you said. And um, so. So Ulle Granat's contribution here will be um, a dialogue with me. And um, I thought maybe that one could begin with some questions. I, 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 right now, in the, for those of you who haven't seen the small, um, uh, the small exhibit in, in, in the study library, um, we, there's a vitrine there which has to do with uh, Flyktpunkter this early conceptual art show here in Stockholm. Uh, but we also highlight some things that have to do with that show, or at least with artists through that show. And uh, we, when you entered, maybe you saw that we've moved a quite important Dan Graham sculpture much closer to the entrance. So it will be, I already see that it's quite uh, effective. Children love it and they run around there. And it's much more part of our, of our museum already. And we also, show a film that I don't think was part of the show, but came about somehow through your collaboration with Dan Graham. Um, 
so, um, and it's called Rock My Religion, and it's become a very legendary art piece. And I would say one of the most influential and um, yeah, famous things that this museum has ever produced, I would say. Uh, uh, Dan Graham became such an important person in the art world and still is, both as an artist and as a writer. And the film um, is um, something that I think many people in the world maybe actually don't even know that it's produced by Morgana Museet. But maybe, Ulle, why did you do this show? What was Flyktpunkter? Well, uh, there was a strong link with the U.S. in the 60s and early 70s during Pontus Fulten's reign here at the museum. And that was all about the cityscape and the city's images and uh, mainly pop art. And that abruptly ended when he left in 1973 with the New York collection for Stockholm, which was still focused on the city, there was some minimal art and, um, and those things. And I was curious about this. It started, my first day in the US was in the spring of 1968. And through friends, I was brought to Robert Smithson's studio. And uh, he showed me his things and um, <laughs> talked about his ideas about entropy. And, uh, and then suddenly he said, let's go over to a friend of mine next door, and that was Saul Lewitt. And so we went to see Saul Lewitt, and uh, Smithson continued to talk. And at a certain point, Saul Lewitt takes me by the arm and whispers in my ear, don't think that everything he says has something to do with me. And uh, that raised my curiosity, and, and so it stayed until I came here uh, 10 years later. And I had kept contact, especially with, with Saul Lewitt, and I was also very curious about Eva Hesse. So I talked to Saul and said, could you help me to put together a significant show of, uh, of this generation of artists, which had chosen quite a different concept. It was not any longer the city. And, and the pop iconology, it was the nature, it was back to the 19th century, to uh, Walden Pond and Thoreau and uh, the painters who went Middle West and went to Mesoamerica and, uh, and painted. And uh, we had a long discussion that ended up with these seven artists. Uh, so that was it, it was a curiosity on my side to to find Did out. Did you feel that these seven were a group of some sort? No, they they all knew each other. They were friends, and they had a common mentor in this elderly lady, um, um, Ruth Vollmer, who was their link to Europe because she was a refugee, a Jewish ref a refugee in, in New York. She had been a friend of uh, Giacometti's. She had a collection of Giacometti works. She introduced these uh, young American artists to uh, classical European music, Bach in particular. And uh, so she was important. I mean, she was not around any longer when we did this. Neither was Eva Hesse, nor was uh, Bob Smithson. They were, they were all dead. Mm. Um, but... Uh, and was this the first time these artists and, and, and this kind of art was shown in, in Stockholm? I ha would say yes. Had you shown conceptual? Had you shown Lawrence Wiener and, and people like that already? No, 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 no. 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 Uh, I mean, Lawrence Wiener and Joseph Kosuto so were not part of this. Kosut had been shown in the galleries. In in, uh, I mean, Aronovich had shown Josef Kosut in um, uh, quite early, mm. but not the museum. Mm. When I mean. Long before you became the director here, you had been a curator and you'd been very involved in the museum. Were there group shows that, m or were there exhibitions that were not simply uh, solo shows, monographic shows, that had been very influential f for your way of thinking about of or art and what an exhibition can be? Not really. 
<clears throat> I mean, I had been working profoundly with the Paul Tech exhibition, but that was still a solo show, mm -hmm. even if he had a crew here that that made the pyramid possible. But uh, not, I mean, Pontus made this show. Uh, uh, poetry must be made by all. That uh, where he had a guest curator, Ronald Hunt, from mm. Newcastle. Mm, but that was a very different kind of show. Very different. I remember that once you told me that that people sometimes only remember the big, uh, spectacular, uh, super well attended solo shows, and in your case it was Matisse and and and, and Picasso and. Uh, whereas more intellectual things like this, or more, uh, in, a, in a way, intellectually perhaps even more ambitious things like this, tend to kind of fall into oblivion a little bit? Well, I can't say we had a line outside the museum <laughs> when we made Vanishing <laughs> Points. <laughs> no. That's for sure. Was it very, uh, was it not well attended at all? Not very much. No, it, um, no. I think people were bewildered. Mm. And, um, I mean, did it, w there are images in here. I mean, I did not see it. I, I could have seen it as a teenager, but I didn't. Um, was it a very, I mean, let's say visually reduced and dry exhibition or? Quite dry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Quite dry. <laughs> I would say so. Yeah. Um, you had Lucy Lippard in as a, uh, as a, as a author. Yes. How did you find her? Or how did she find you? Well, I found her because she had written about, about all, all these artists, yeah, yeah, yeah. Eva Hesse in particular, and saw Lewitt also. So it was easy to, to ask her for a, for a contribution. Um, one question maybe, since you've been a director for so many years of, s of several important institutions here, the difference between being a curator and being a director? I mean, this is something I should know, but I want to ask you. Uh, 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 how to, to, to create a whole program of a big museum, like National Museum or Moderna Museum back then, is that also a form of curating or is that a different kind of task? Mm. Qualified schizophrenia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is. Yeah. Yes. I to agree. be a bureaucrat <laughs> and to be, uh, to be a curator. And to make possible exhibitions that you have not mm. done so much, mm. I mean, had so much to do with, maybe. Mm. So tell me a little bit about Dan Graham, then. The, I mean, the, 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 the film that we show, you should all see, it's a Rock My Religion. It's a legendary a collage kind of, uh, or what should one call it? A collage? A kind of collage, but with a with a line in it. With a, mm. there I mean, is a red maybe line. you should. I mean, I I have seen it now a number of times. I've read about it, but what would you say that it is? <sighs> he is tracing uh, the uh, the idea about rock music and the importance of rock music, which for him was a religious thing. I I would say, but he traces that back also to the uh, religious experience, to the free independent churches in the US. And uh, it came about that once when I was in New York preparing this exhibition, he brought me to a lot of rock clubs that I would never have found out about if he had not been my guide. Mm. And it was quite an experience for somebody who wasn't too well oriented in the rock music. And then he told me that he was trying to synthesize what we had experienced during a long night in a film, but he was out of money, he couldn't finish it. And, and you should note the ambiguity, ambiguity of the title, Rock My Religion. I mean, rock my religion, rock it, but rock is my religion. Mm. So it was... Um, I mean, for him, what we experienced uh, that night in the rock clubs was a very um, sublime experience. I cannot exactly say that I shared his experience, but uh, it was very interesting. Mm. And then he said to me, listen, I have a film on this theme and it is uh, almost ready, but I'm out of money. He never had any money. And he, uh, I, s I said, how much do you need to finish the film? And he said, $5,000. And I said, okay, put as uh, Moderna Museet as co-producer 
Uh, now it doesn't even say copper, it says produced by Moderna Museet. So ah, you uh, did quite very generous. well. <laughs> I felt I was generous when I gave him the $5,000. But it was not shown here then. N it wasn't ready during the exhibition. It came later on. It would have looked kind of strange maybe in this exhibition. Uh, well, maybe it could have eased up the dryness <laughs> a little. Yeah, it would. <laughs> Once he's, I mean, we have had now uh, from several years he's become so popular in this country. Patty Smith has been right here and in the mm. our garden and, uh, and everywhere in Stockholm. And she's quite visible in your film or in that film. Yes, she is. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, she yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if we think a little bit as a last uh, question before we move on to Mar Maria, uh, um, when I saw you in the lobby, I was carrying this and I was happy to see that you were also carrying it, yes. as if we would have agreed that it was this book we were going to talk about, which we didn't, but... Uh, yes. Oh, or a little bit. Uh, Camilla. Oh, so, so she yeah, had already yeah, prepared. Yeah. Yeah, I'm happy. <laughs> uh, uh, because I wanted to ask you, what could be... I mean, if we look, if we use this little uh, uh, library-like space to look at the... It's not a retrospective, it's rather like an introspective of this museum. How, you know, look inside what were exhibitions that meant something and that we should not forget about. And often we only have archival material, but one can have conversations and things. What are other exhibitions, since you know this institution maybe better than ha almost anyone alive now? You've been, uh, you've been since the beginning of the uh, Moderna Museet, you've been either looking at things or working or writing about it. And what are key exhibitions and don't tell me now uh, Hun or uh, Rörelse Konsten, but other, I, I mean, if you, maybe I now, you know, I ask you a question, you should have been given a chance to think, but what are key exhibitions that maybe we have forgotten about that one can look at again and, and see that they actually were more interesting than we, or than we thought, or that we, uh, that we don't, things that we don't tend to think about? Hmm. Because, I mean, many people internationally, I think, think about Moderna Museet as something where there was pop art and there was Niki de Sanfal and Duchamp, but there's been so many other things. Yeah, of course, I vividly remember on Kabara, which was, uh, but that was already during my time. It was not before. Uh, that was to me a very important show. And the fact that he lived here in in one of the buildings on the island for a year. I remember and you once told me a story about that. Maybe that would be a, a nice ending for our little mm. session. That he wanted to do it. No, what was it? You proposed an exhibition early. No, yeah, I said to Pontus, because Pontus was still the director, but he was then discouraged by um, the events in the early 70s. And I said, you have on Kavara here, why don't you make an exhibition? It's literally 100 meters away from here where he lived. He, yeah, he lived yeah. for almost a year. And then Pontus sighed and said, it would be much cheaper for the Moderna Museet to pay those who want to see on Kavara a flight ticket to New York and look at it there. <laughs> and then he was on his way to Paris, really. Okay. But uh, we did the exhibition a yeah. couple of years later. Yeah.